Okay, so is uh, everybody pretty much in a chair that wants to see? Because if you if you want to take a minute and come closer, this is the time. We're using the whiteboards. It's old school. It's going to be fun. All right. So thanks everyone for coming out. We're, uh, this is the first time we've been at TAG, so we're, we're super excited to be here. Uh, this is Johan, CTO of TAG, and he's going to uh, say a few words, and then we'll get, uh, get rolling. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. So I'm super excited for this evening's event. I'm super excited to be uh, hosting SF Data Mining, um, and I'm super excited for Anthony's talk. Um, a few of you have asked me um, what is it that TAG does, so I thought I would just give a, a brief answer to that um, so that we can get, a, get ahead of that question. Uh, TAG is doing social discovery, that is we make products that bring people together. We're essentially adding edges to the social graph, creating friendships. We do about 100 million of those every month. We have members in 220 countries, uh, 300 million of them, and all of that's happening from uh, here, 150 people, um, and uh, some other locations as well, all on office and so forth. So uh, without further ado, I want to pass it back to uh, Jason for the rest of the introductions, and uh, welcome. <laughs> all right, thank you, Ron. All right, so we've got a great talk tonight. We have Anthony Bach. He, is, uh, he has got his PhD uh, from Penn, and then went to Stanford for his postdoc, where he worked for Gunnar Carlson, who is co-founder of Ayazi. So, to be, uh, uh, yeah, I've seen it before, wonderful talk. All right, uh, thank you uh, for, for having us uh, and having, having me speak. So, um, I'm using the whiteboard because uh, I'm a mathematician and that's what we do. Um, and uh, I hope if, if I'm not writing big enough, people in the back just to say something and I'll, I'll try and write bigger. Bigger. <laughs> okay, so what does uh, the frame the framework what we're doing? Uh, what does I'm gonna just, uh, what does the uh, topological data analysis do? And I'm speaking here about the topological data analysis that we do at IASTI. So it's a legitimate field of research. But there are lots of strains of, to what's going on in topological data analysis. I'm going to focus on the strain that happens at Ayazi. So one way of looking at it, and, and I hope that by the end of my talk you'll understand all these different ways of viewing it, is that it's a uniform framework for machine learning. Uniform framework. And by that I mean a lot of different machine learning methods fit into the topological data framework in a natural way. And I'll get to that, I'll explain how they fit in at the very end of my talk. I'll sort of end, end with how they fit in. And you won't see anything that maybe looks like machine learning unless you have a very astute eye for most of the time. Another way to, to uh, think about it is that it's a way to summarize, a way, a way to summarize complex, and I don't mean that in the technical sense, complex geometries. So it's a way of taking very complicated spaces and extracting some summary of what's going on in that space. And then finally, which actually seems like maybe the opposite of item two, is that it's a way, a way to extract, extract subtle signals. In data. Uh, these should be questions. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it. That, that's what it does. Uh, and so this year, I think this is this year is like zooming, and this year is like the opposite of zooming. This is kind of going out. Um, opposite. Of <laughs> Obviously, next time I give this talk, I'm going to look up a good word for the opposite. Okay. Um, 
And then maybe a final thing that it does, which, which sort of doesn't really sit on the same level as these, but is, is maybe a footnote, is that it brings meaning and, and interpretability to um, big data. And I mean meaning in a certain kind of technical sense that, that, I'll, that I'll describe during the, the talk. And, and just as a, a side note, this is, this is why scientists love us. So we have lots of um, uh, people in, in various kinds of bioscience. And, and I would say it's this last side note that, that really uh, draws them to what we do. Okay, so unfortunately, Okay, so as they asked me, um, we have a kind of guiding principle to, to what we do. And uh, it's, it's um, summarized by um, data has shaped, so data has shaped. And shape has meaning. So this here, I should actually you guys that this is over here actually, so I'll just leave it, leave it up to the top. Data and shape. And the shape has meaning. So what we want to do is extract the meaning from shape. And that's what this talk is going to be about. So this item here on our mantra is what I'm going to describe to you. How do we get meaning from the shape of data? What does that mean? How do we, how do, we do it? Um, I think just really philosophically, what we do is we let the data speak for itself. So we come at the problem with as few preconceived notions as possible. And a preconceived notion, in this case, means a certain statistical model for the data, or a certain kind of linearity or homogeneity property of the data. We don't want to have those assumptions when we, um, when we start to analyze data. We want to let the data tell us and lead us to the answer as much as possible. So that's really, that's the core, the core idea of what we're doing. Um, so how do we create shape? So before I get into the meeting, let's just talk about how we create shape briefly. So uh, we create shape by maybe a choice of features. So what are we measuring about some object or system? And um, a notion, and I, I mean notion, um, so a notion of similarity. So distance is one notion of similarity. That it's a very strong and rigid notion of sim similarity, but we don't necessarily need such a rigid notion. We just deal with um, similarities, or maybe not even strictly speaking the similarity, but just tell, tell me what your local neighborhood is. And then shape. How do you how do you take the shape? How do you get shape from this kind of information? Um, so someone asked me the other day, well, what is shape? And I came up with this, I'm trying it out for the first time, so you'll have to tell me if this, if this uh, makes any sense. Its shape is um, a global realization of local constraints. So that's what shape is. There's lots of things that locally constrain what's happening, and then you piece that all together into some big picture, and you get a shape. So if you know a little bit more mathematics, that's the picture if you talk about manifolds, right? You have local, local open sets, little local neighborhoods that you glue together and that gluing process, that global realization is what creates the shape. And so that's that's what the shape is. And now let's get to the meaning part. If you want, if, if what uh, if it doesn't make bubble sense to you, um, just pick up shape and do a bunch of points, the distances between them. It's not really a definition. I was just trying it out. I was just trying it out. I said, it's the global, the global realization of local constraints. Right? 
Here is also maybe another way of saying this: you have too many features and you have too many points that you measure. So, um, one way that I like to think about this problem is that there are too many stories in your data. So that that's that's the another way of phrasing what this problem is. It's like in this room before everyone got quiet. If you walk in, it's just white noise, right? Everyone's talking at once. And what you want to do, or something you might want to do, is um, zoom in on individual conversations, right? That's like extracting meaning from the white noise in the room. Another thing you might want to do is summarize all the different conversations that are happening. What, generally speaking, are people talking about? So the problem of big data is the white noise problem, too many points in too high dimension. And the goal is the summary and zooming, right? What are the stories that are important to you? Uh, another example uh, of that is peak expression level in cancer tumors. There are lots of, so some of the genes that are being expressed have to do with dysfunction in the cell in cancer. On the other hand, most of the genes are just Regular cellular function, right? I'm doing this, I'm whatever, processing that enzyme, I'm splitting that up, right? And when you examine gene expression levels, for say all the genes that are expressing in the cell, in the, human, in the cancer tumor, you want to be able to zoom in on the cancer story and figure out what, what are the anomalies that have to do with cancer. And that's the same problem, that's the same white noise problem that, that the that the room full of people has. So, um, all right. So all of these ideas, or all of these examples, encapsulate the need to reduce, or to reduce the amount of information in the problem. So all of these ideas are reduce. Uh, yes, I'm eventually going to move away from philosophy and start doing some of that. So, you can say what we do. So, what does Ayazi do? So, this is where we come into the, into the picture here. Is we produce topological summaries. So, Ayazi produces topological summaries with summaries via Continuous function. I'll just say function because actually continuous is not correct. Be a function. So that's what we do. Okay, so how do we do that? What does that mean? So now, now we're going to get into an example. So there's not aren't going to be really any formulas here. I'm just going to draw some pictures to explain this statement here. What does it mean to produce a topological summary via a function? So, now I'm going to explain how we do that in three steps. We're going to start in a kind of math world where there are no data points. We're going to have continuous functions, manifolds, nice world, and we're going to sort of just take a couple steps and lead to the data world. But I think it's, it's sort of, it's a little bit, the idea is a little bit more clear on the math side. And there's some details that caught, get caught up in the translation to the data world that I don't want us thinking about right at the so what is in math world? So this here is the pair of hands. 
So, our inaccessible shape that we're trying to understand is represented here as a pair of pants. So here you can see it on the board. So, so the way I'm drawing this, I'm thinking of this very it's empty on the inside. It's just the, shape. the actual pants, no legs. Inside, right? We can see it here, and we can see it because I want, to sh I want you to see when I write down what the summary is exactly what it is that we're summarizing. But you should imagine a situation where this is covered up and you're only going to be able to access the, sum access the summary that I draw. So how do we get these summaries? So <coughs> I take a function on the data like this. So the way I'm drawing it, I'm thinking of everything so the some point P here Everything that's just the left of P, so this circle here, gets collapsed by the function and gets sent to P. It's just the height function for the pair of pants. Okay, so this here, this function, we call the length. This here the length part. Um, and the way I'm going to produce the summary sounds very, really simple. I'm just going to take for every point P, I look at the inverse image, which are just the set, set of points that go to P. I'm going to collapse them to a point. So I draw a point here. So that's the summary of a this point P. I take, sorry, I don't take all the points in the inverse image. I take the connected components of the inverse image. Pi zero of the inverse image. And I just do that for all the points Go through my function values and look at inverse images, I collapse the set. So in this case here, I get one line, and then once I hit here, for a point up here, there are two. There are two inverse image sets, so I have two points up at the top. So this here is one function. So it's a continuous function, the way I've drawn it. And in general, for uh, for first pass through the material, just think continuous function, or if you want smooth function, whatever, some nice class of function. In reality, there are lots of good reasons to not restrict ourselves to continuous function. That's like the an advanced topic is why would you want to do this continuous function and what do they give you? Um, in any case, so here's our first summary. Now I'm going to draw, I think, we're going to draw a second summary. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these vertical lines. I'm going to just send vertical lines down to like this. So it's not it's not exactly straight slices. They, they curve a little bit because of the pants the pants curve out a little bit. And what's the summary there? Well, on this edge, I just have one point. Then as I move this way, I have a line here, and then I have a line on the back side, so I have two points. So as I move away, I have two points. Those two points come together here, so I have a circle. In this middle region, everything is actually one piece, right, front to back. So I just have one, one piece here, and then symmetry on the other side, I get another circle. Okay, so here, here we have two different summaries um, of, what, of what's going on in the pair of pants. Each of them summarizes something different. There's a different story that they're pulling out. This one here summarizes, tells us about the splitting of the legs. This one here says these legs have, have two holes. Right? So two functions, and I get two stories from the data, two different summaries. And in a certain sense, it's everything that's going on in pair of pants. Right? There's not a lot going on in pants. There's the splitting and there's the people. Okay, so now I'm going to give you an exercise because that's how I roll. <laughs> and there are some caveats to this exercise. One, the people here from Ayazdi cannot answer because they know the answer. Two, the people who saw my last talk at AI, you cannot answer 
because you're just looking smart, but you already heard me tell you the answer. Or you were, I think, the one person who said the answer. Either way, you can't answer. Okay, so here's the exercise, and I'll give everyone a couple moments to think about it. Okay, so what, what is the summary if I use both functions, both functions at the same time. Okay, so let me, before anyone knows that the answer, let me try and clarify what I mean by that. I mean, instead of taking one function, I take both of them as a pair. Each of them map, maps to a real number, so I'm mapping down to some rectangle in the plane. I take the point P in the rectangle, I take inverse images of P, right? I take the connected components of the inverse images of P. I just draw that out. What do I get? So to clarify the So the method is, the method, just to, to say it again, is I have a function on the data, okay? I take inverse images of points, connected components of inverse images of points, I collapse the connected components, and I draw one point for each connected component. I take inverse images of the connected components, for every, the summary is for every connected component of the inverse image, I draw a point. That's the summary, and I just scanned through the value. Yes? No. It's a good, it's a good guess. It's not the product. So something more complicated is happening with the product of the function. Any other? So here's the thing, it's kind of a trick question. It's, a, it's not, I mean, it's, it has a real answer you can figure out, but the trick is the summary is the space itself. You recover the pair of pants in, in, in its entirety. And you get that because if you take a point here, think of this here is the line corresponding to one function, this here is the line corresponding to another function, the point P sits at, there's one point that's at their intersection. So the inverse image of P has to be at the intersection of two level sets of the corresponding function. So in this case here, the way I've drawn it, let's just take here, I would have one level set, this here is the other level set, and here I would cover two points for this P. As I moved around, as P moved around, I would these two points, right, these points would all just fill out the whole shape. So the summary is, the summary is no summary. So what does that tell us? That says, given a rich enough set of functions, we can recover the whole space that we started with. So there's no kind of, uh, we're not like munging the data in some irrecoverable way. With a rich set of functions, we recover the whole space. But that, that it sort of maybe gives us peace to sleep at night knowing that, but it doesn't actually help us. And it completely misses the point. Why would you want to recover the space? The whole purpose is to summarize because the space is too complicated, right? So in this simple case, so basically there are two stories going on, the splitting and the legs, and the two sub functions together recover the whole thing. But in the complicated space, first of all, you might need a lot of functions to recover the whole space. And second of all, if you recovered it, you're back at the beginning, which is, well, what do I do with the complicated space? So, 
So what we do, we use the function, both the choice of function and the number of functions, to tune the summary to extract exactly the information that we want. So that's, that's the, the message of our exercise. And we can extract as much or as little information because we can go all the way from you know, a line drawing all the way up to the full complexity of the space. It's still a little wrong by answer. No, so there's actually so the output here, it's a subtle point. So there's the right, there's the the length, and then there's like this squiggly aerial arrow, which means do the procedure I described, which is draw a point for every connected component of the interest image. I'm actually not giving you any embedding information in that statement. So what I'm producing actually this is being a little technical, I'm making an abstract space that has no embedded dimension. And that abstract space is going to be the same as the space that I started with. So the space I started with, the way I drew it, it's embedded, but the procedure I told, told, told you doesn't have an embedding attached to it, so it just sits no, nowhere in the floor. So you have to be a little careful about that. Yes? Let's talk about those kind of questions at the end. Um, it's simply through. I'm going to say no, but I don't know for sure. I have to be a little bit more careful. Yeah, I'm not. Well, we use continuity here to tell us how to piece it back together. Yeah, but okay, fine. <laughs> I'm saying I'm not 100% sure. I don't want to think about the black part, right? I wrote everything out that I'm going to say. I'm not doing any actual thinking on it. <laughs> so we can, I can think about it and talk, talk later. Um, all right. Okay, so what, what kind of things might you want to do with this? So, a common task is that you have data and you're trying to extract information, the location, say, or some other information about some subset of your data. So, the way I'm going to draw that here is I have a little, right, these are like, these are the people I'm interested in. Those are the people who buy new BMWs every year. So, I want to make sure I get my buy BMW message out to them. With cancer, so or who might develop cancer, so I want to make sure that they have treatment. So what happens? Well, if you just follow the map, uh, the procedure, this little spot, right? Everything is locality preserving, as I've described as a continuous function, and this little spot here will just end up on some little spot on the Y. So now, in my summary, I can identify. I see ah. All my people are here, and I can start to understand what put them there because I understand something about this function. And this is it. Well, I mean, there's some problems with this view. But it's, what if I have two groups and they're lined up like that? Well, then they end up. No way. Then they end up on top of each other in that particular choice of lens. Luckily, you're not stuck with a, single, with a single choice of lens. So, if we look down on our other summary, and we see that we'll separate by our locality preserving, we'll separate out those two groups. Well, what are other ways um, that groups can be in here? These groups are particularly nice because they're very localized in the data set. So maybe they're easy to extract. A much harder question is, well, what defines right, this group here? There may be lots of, of shared variables, lots of different variables, and you want to extract that. Well, in, in this slide here, that ends up 
right there, right, we, we, we can capture with the right lens, we can capture that whole group exactly. So over here, even when we captured the red, we didn't capture it exactly, we got a bunch of junk with it. Right? With the right lens, even with a very complicated space, you can, you can capture it exactly. And you can see over here, well, it gets smeared out everywhere. So there are some subtle issues going on here. Some, some data problems are, have this kind of locality property, property, meaning that the thing you're interested in is actually localized essentially under any choice of lens and metric that you choose to try. Those are easy problems, they're nice, you're always happy when you see them because it means essentially no matter what you do, every lens and every metric gives you like more information about the, the thing that you're looking at. Other problems, Harder problems, like this, require a much more careful cho choice of when to, to do the locality. So if you have a spread that's just above the waistline, that would work a single um, group rather than the total split, where would you project that to? Would you project that to the right one? Yeah, yeah, that's easy, but what about the other one? Uh, so it depends where it is. If it's right through it, it's going to go here, if it's a little bit further this way, it's going to go like that. Depends on, depends on where that here is. And in all cases, it's going to go over there. Okay, so the, the message is, well, there are some subtle issues here. Uh, and that multiple summaries, looking at different lenses, help you figure out what's going on. Some things are separated by one lens, not by another. Some things are spread out throughout the whole space with one lens and are concentrated with another lens. So the use of multiple lenses is going to help you figure out what's going on. All right, so that's math world. No, it's just the one. Um, okay, so that's math world. What I want to do now is tell you how to move this, this picture here into data work. So there's two steps. Okay. So step one is we have a problem with our procedure. The construction of the summary from the lens procedure. If I'm in data world, my space consists of a finite number of points. And I have my lens, the way I pieced everything together, I used, right, I took inverse images of points and then just kind of slid along, piecing, and I knew how to draw, how to piece together the summary. Well, in data world, most, in, most real numbers have nothing in their inverse image, right? No matter how big your data is, it's still a finite collection of points in the real numbers, blah, 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 they're big. So most inverse images, are empty. So that's going to completely, you can't draw a summary. Because you don't know how to connect connect points because there are no inversing. So what do you do? We fatten the points into open sets. And we look at inverse images of open sets. So I'm just going to go back here and draw that. So I have my function f, my real line, and I'm going to take, so here, this here is u1, this here is u2, and this is u3. Those are my open sets. And I take inverse images of open sets, and I'm going to draw, an, I'm going to call it a node instead of a point. I'm going to draw a node for every uh, connected component of the inverse image of an open set. So if you want inverse image is one connected component, I draw a point. U2, inverse image is one connected component, I draw a node. U3, up, there's two connected components, I draw two nodes. For U3, and now how do I connect nodes? I connect nodes that have a not empty intersection in the inverse image. I haven't discretized the pair of pants yet. Oh, I thought we were working with the other one from the back. No, I just told you what I'm going to 
do for data points, but actually I have to discretize the pair of hands. There's some more subtleties there. One step at a time. We can do what I've done so far. This is in math world, but I'm adjusting the method in math world. We haven't done data points yet. Okay, so these two inverse images intersect here, so I'm going to draw an edge between them. This inverse image intersects this one, and it intersects that one, but these two inverse images don't share an intersection, so there's no edge between them. So this is now my new summary procedure. So I take open sets, I look at inverse images of open sets, I draw nodes to represent the connected components of the inverse image. Well, there are some parameters now, unfortunately, in the construction. Well, maybe fortunately. So one parameter is uh, the number of open sets, or maybe the size, number of uh, open sets, and the other is, how much do they overlap? Overlap. So we call this here the resolution, and this here we call the gain. So what happens? So let's look at resolution. Let's look at one of these parameters. If I set the resolution really high, which means I take lots of open sets, right? And I look at the image of the resistance to see what happens. I'm going to get well, lots of nodes. So actually, turning the resolution up past a certain point isn't giving us new information for the way I've drawn it. Everything, so the structure of the summary along this different direction is actually encapsulated at this very low resolution, which is three open sets. When I take the finer resolution, I'm just filling out details in that structure, which you may want to do for one reason or another. What happens if I take fewer open sets, so let's just say I take U1 and U2, well then in both cases you have a single component of the inverse image, so you just get a line, this line I'm really just recovering the image of the function, and finally if I take one set, I just get a single node. So resolution is called resolution because by changing it, by choosing different numbers of open sets, can exclude certain size and topological feature from the summary. Right? And this, this example is very simple, right? The, the only features to exclude are the, the legs, and so if we choose a really low resolution, we don't see them. Bumping it up, we start to see them. So this is still the function here is still a continuous function. I drew, I drew a point for every connected component of the inverse image of the function. So that's the continuous function. So this node here represents, if you want, represents the entire set U1. This red represents U2. These two nodes both represent U3. U3, 1, U3, 2. And, yeah. Uh, if you want, if you want to think about this in a different way, this here is basically a Venn diagram of the pants for this covering, of this set of open pants. I draw edges when things are different. So you, when you choose to apply a certain lens to the data set, there is an explicit notion of resolution. You have to choose a resolution, or you have ways of adjusting the resolution due to our map. Yeah, if you're doing this by hand, you, you choose a resolution. Yeah. All right. Um, so the game is a little bit more subtle, and it has to do with the tightness of the network. I'm just going to uh, ignore that. Okay, so now we need to actually add data points. We need to discretize the pair of bands. And 
when we do, well, what part of this method won't work? The part that won't work is the part where we say the nexus components of the inverse image. Why doesn't that work? Well, because you have discrete data, right? Every point sits by itself. So we need to replace connected components of the inverse image, and what we do is um, we replace it with clustering. So to find the data version of connected components, we do clustering on the inverse image of, of open sets of a length. So, so we replace So the new procedure for our lens is to, I'm going to uh, break this out, cluster within inverse images of open sets. Then how do we draw our edges? Well, you notice that we still have these intersection inverse images. So points in there are going to go to some cluster on this side, but also some cluster on the other side. So when that happens, we're going to connect the nodes representing those clusters. So a cluster with the that connect uh, nodes when they share So that's our new method. Well, what does it look like? Because we're doing some clustering procedure there, we will tend not to maybe get just a single node for a different image, but we'll get something that looks like this, which is the same essential summary, but because maybe your clustering method wasn't optimal, and to some degree we're insensitive clustering method you choose, you end up with something like that. Where these nodes represent clusters in different images and edges represent shared elements between clusters. So this is what we do, this is the output that you get from our product. You can see it's the iris, an iris map up. You can see this output. It's actually, like I said, it's not an embedded graph, so there's some things we want to be careful about. It's not an embedded graph. The nodes are points. Individual points in the original data can be distributed in multiple nodes in the network. Right? So there's some subtleties that you, you need to wrap your head around when you, when you read about our graphs. So, I mean, there's lots of ways of saying, uh, so I'll just say some of the other ways of doing what we do. We're taking the nerve of the covering and using by the map. That's another way of saying what we do. Another way of saying what we do is we're taking the second projection of the Meyer via torus of the cover. Another way of saying what we do. Another way is the, uh, we're using the cover by the map and drawing the Venn diagram for the cover. So there's multiple views on describing what the procedure is. I, I think that's an advantage. Some people, you know, first time you see something that's uncomfortable, that there's a million ways of saying the same thing. Each of them has their own kind of history and, and you know, perspective and metaphor. That comes along. Okay. That's right, but it's actually very, so yes, but in general what we see is that the, the features, the main features of your graph stay the same, and that's because if you take it, a small set here, and you take the inverse image, it's kind of like linearizing the clustering problem. 
And so you're less sensitive to the particular notion of clustering you want to use. A classic example maybe from machine learning is clustering the, the embedded noisy circles. If I take a small open set here and I look at the slice, it's much easier to cluster that into four clusters using any, you know, a lot of different methods rather than trying to just globally try and cluster the, the noisy embedded circles. Some, some clustering methods work, some don't, right? There's a lot of details there. And so, the, because we're clustering in those slices, we've made the problem easier. And it's true, things can change with the clustering method, but the sort of, I don't get hung up on that. It's the sort of an insensitivity to the method, too, in the problem. The other thing is that, just to emphasize, I only got the clustering at the end because a lot of people want to sort of uh, obsess about the clustering that because there are so many methods that they're familiar with, particularly if you come from a machine learning background, it's like clustering. And it's not, I, I would say, sort of thinking of us as a clustering system is not really the right way to think about what we're doing. The right way, the right way, when to be, is the way I introduce it with continuous functions. And, 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 and. Uh, I'm actually running out of time. But we'll have questions at the end for sure. So, um, just some, some um, comments. So, real data is almost never let point sample from a manifold. Don't worry about it. Everything goes through. We didn't use the, the, the manifold structure anywhere in what we did. Um, also, we had no imposition on the shape of the data to be with that we started with. We just read off what it tells us. There's no homogeneity, there's no statistical assumptions, there's no linearity assumption, there's no other model assumptions about the sh shape, other than that, what I would say is a very mild assumption at the beginning, which is a notion of locality or similarity. You have to be able to say, when are two things almost the same? And that's all, that's the only input we use, is what is almost the same. And you only actually need to know it locally. You don't need to be able to give a number for everything that you Set, but just say these are the things that I like to me. And so, yeah. And then finally, there's a lot of generalizations I'm not talking about. In general, you consider instead of maps to a real line, you can consider maps lenses that go to arbitrary other spaces y, and you fiber over over y, and you look at the same procedure. And that gives you different ways of understanding your data. And in particular, maybe a nice one. Uh, the first one you'd want to do is, is maybe open the circle. Uh, you the different kinds of information you want to present. Okay, so we're almost done. And there's. If we actually just wait. I'm just going to uh, push right through to the end of my talk. You can ask me. I can redraw a diagram. It's all in my notes, too. We can just flip to the page and we'll, we'll see exactly what I wrote. Remember, there's no thinking up here. <laughs> right? I even said, Rick, okay, wait, what about the lens? Right? I just said that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The lens. It all boils down to, well, how do you find good lenses, right? That's the crux of the issue. To get good summaries, we need good lenses. And luckily for us, people, maybe even some of you in the room, have spent a lot of time coming up with lenses for us to use. So some of them come from geometry. So centrality. Centrality is like measuring the distance from the center of mass, except it works for abstract metric spaces. So that's a good lens for us. But that does is it, is it detects outliers in your data, and it you kind of move into the outsides of your data, and you filter inwards, and you, you know, you're clustering as you go in, and you get an understanding of the topology with respect to outliers. Um, if you have a smooth manifold underneath things, you can do things like filtering by curvature, you can do uh, circular coordinates, which I mentioned. Um, we have a way of 
creating those from cohomology cycles in the data. That's like a whole separate lecture explaining that scene. So statisticians have also been coming up with lenses for us. So you can do things like you take the mean, you know, all your statistics, the variance of a row, entropy, um, density, density filtration, right? Filtered by density. You, you can pull apart. One of the great things that we do that allows us to be really subtle with data is we can pull apart data by density sublevel sets. And that allows us to get exactly at, if you have something that's happening at, let's say, a, a, a moderately low dense region, we can kind of zoom in on that and, and understand exactly what's going on. So this here is a really important one for us. I've actually, I should maybe ask people, I always put it under statisticians, but I don't know if density really, I don't know, depends on your perspective. I think, that, I think of that as being like physics. Um, it's going to go somewhere. Machine learners, the so-called neo-statisticians, also have been coming up with lenses for it. So taking um, SVD, PCA, taking the coordinates, the first two coordinates, SVD coordinates, and PCA coordinates, the first N coordinates there, um, neural networks, so using um, like autoencoders to extract features, and then you reduce that to some you know, some number of the most important features, and then spreading your data along those lenses is another lens for us. Uh, maybe if you want to do like four factor machine distance from the separating Kuiper plane, it's a good lens for us. Then we have uh, MDS, like classical embeddings, MDS, ISOMAP, ISOMAP, uh, Disney. Is that what people say? Do people say Disney? Key stochastic, key stochastic neighbor embedding. How is it? TC. TC. I think we'll like to visit it. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Um, and then finally, we have data lenses, which are the things that domain experts maybe might come up with. And uh, here, let me just describe what I mean. Let's say I'm just studying heart disease. I take lots of measurements of the heart. The exact diameter of this and that, the amount of fat, this and that, right? I have all this for all these people, all their, their hearts, and now I want to understand something about heart disease. A good lens to use on that problem would be age. So I would take all those measurements, and rather than trying to find some global structure, I kind of spread it out along the age direction, and I look at how heart disease is different over age. So that's something, you know, this kind of data lens is something that domain, the domain expert will come up with for your problem for, because of some information you know about what you're trying to do. And so this here is how, when I started off and I said, uh, this is a, a uniform framework for machine learning, this is what I mean. If your machine le learning method involves the creation of a function, which it's, kind of, it's like really hard to avoid creating functions you can fit into this framework. And in fact, I would point out that we do, we correct a lot of mistakes, a lot of errors in machine learning methods. The assumptions, the, the, the problems that arise. And as an example, I'm just gonna take PCA here. What does PCA do? PCA finds the, the, the directions of max, maximal variation that most blah, blah, blah. I think you all know what PCA does. Anyway, Wrong. But it's a linear projection onto some hyperplane. And what happens when you do that? Well, if my data, if I have two clusters in the actual data and I'm projecting onto a hyperplane, they end up, they end up together in, in the projection. But because we always remember we cluster in the inverse image, if we're using PCA as a, as a lens, we're always going to tell you that there's actually two clusters living above that point. Or another problem that happens with is that your data can have a kind of separation, but it's in a direction that's not parallel to your projection direction. So when you project this out into PCA, it just looks like a mess. You don't see anything. But again, because we're clustering in that inverse image, we're going to be able to separate these. So we'll spread them out in the PCA direction, but we're going to see that they're separate clusters. 
So when we do, not only do we use, is it a framework for machine learning, but when we use a lot of methods, we actually fix them in a certain sense. We get rid of the problems because we go back to the original space to do our question. Okay, so there's one, there's one last, last thing here, which is that I promise you meaning. So what do I mean? What do I mean by meaning? So the meaning comes from the fact that we can interpret what we're seeing, the features we're seeing, the summary, in terms of the lens. So let me give an example of that. We have now this inaccessible space X. I have a lens. I produce my topological summary. This is this is the this. Oh, I've got the no. Not y, it's the y summary. So how do I assign meaning to what I see? Well, imagine that f is the centrality measure. And here, this here are the least central region, and this here is the, core, this here is the center. This says that I have one core, there's a core where something's happening, and then as I move away from the core, there's two ways of being anomalous. That's how I would read this. So it allows me, the lens actually interprets what I see and it sounds, it sounds meaning to it. There are two ways of being anomalous. So that's if this was centrality. Let's say that this is density and the high density region up, is up top. This says I have a bimodal distribution. I have two ways of being normal, essentially. Let's say that it was um, age, with, and these are looking at, at cancer, uh, cancer or gene expression. As I go up, this says that um, I have one kind of cancer when people are young, and when people are old, I get two kinds of cancer. So the meaning, I get, I, I don't lose, I'm not just getting like a classification engine where I just end up in classes. I actually, I get the lens allows me to interpret what I'm seeing and actually get insight from my data. Where I really learn something new about the structure of the data. I've gone beyond just sort of classification. I've really, I've learned something new. And this is why scientists, I would say, a lot of scientists love our software because they can use it to actually learn things about the world and how it works because of the way they can interpret the summaries. All right, so that's it. Um, Nina has sheep, and sheep has meaning. I think we're at, I'm like probably way over. We're a few minutes over, but. I had a demo, I had use cases, and computers, and a million things to show you. What, what should, I don't know, what should we do? Should we just go straight to questions and skip the use cases? One use case. Okay, so no live demo, and we'll just go to a use case. So, oh, thank you. So let's, um, so these are our networks. Um, so this here is a network of a million users from a mobile app data. This is data about, um, uh, what they were doing with their phones, what applications they were doing, where they were when they were doing it. I know, you don't want to know. And, <laughs> and this here shows essentially customer segmentation. Right? These, these consumers are acting the same, they're doing the same, right? they're connected to some other, right? there's, there's all this sort of detail that's going on here. And, and each of these kinds of things that you see, these features, represent some kind of customer segmentation. For your, for your data. Um, this year is actually, I'm gonna go through a couple of these because they're fast and actually these are really interesting. So this year is from an emergency room um, triage. So when you come into the emergency room, they wanna figure out if they should treat you right away because you're dying or if they should, you can sit there for seven hours because you're fine. So this year, and to do that, they actually, they collect a bunch of data about you, your heart rate, your blood pressure. They also ask you a bunch of questions. So, so there's like numeric information, there's categorical information. We're very good at mixing these things. It's one of our, our, our really nice things that we do. In any case, this year is the predicted survival rate, meaning they're predicting these people are really, really sick, and you know, these people are totally fine. This year is what actually happened. So this year is a model debugging. They have some learning model that they've trained, and what we can do is we can look at it and very quickly debug their model, that there is a systematic error up here. And we were able to do this um, 
much better than they were able to do it by themselves. And in fact, we have statistical tools built into the, to the product that will actually tell you exactly what's going on there. And it turns out that on these questionnaires, a certain item was missing from the nurse who took the information. Not any item missing, but there was a certain thing. And if that thing was missing, the model was failing. So they needed to go back and make sure to get that missing piece of information, that that was absolutely key for the accuracy of their model. Um, uh, so this here is a thousand pe people with um, some, they're uh, looking at, um, what's it called, Ethan? It's um, SNP data. SNP data. And so this here is, uh, we've created a network and put a metric on the SNP data. And anyway, you can see we get graphic segmentation, and this here is the story of cancer, which I'm forgetting right now. But we're able to isolate um, by essentially the, the nationality of the person or certain signal for cancer that, that only, only when you see it in, in certain nationality is it relevant. Um, here's another cancer one. Um, okay, well, that's it. So those were the use cases.